Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Welcome to um, ITS 520. Um, let's get started. Um, so just a few reminders. Let's actually take a look at the calendar um, really quick there. <clears throat> So you should be looking at the calendar right now. And if we look at what we have left, basically today is November 23rd. So um, I haven't added the link here for the video from last week, but the video is already up in the channel. <laughs> So if you just go um, to the YouTube channel here, you'll find the video. I will, I, you know, I'll, I'll do that today. I, I forgot to do this. So last week we covered um, Keras and I got as far as the very basics of Keras, as you know. Um, the other topics of Keras that, you know, basically the last thing that we cover, you know, up until we got last week, that's enough for you guys to use Keras, you know, just pretty much like you've been using Weka and SKLearn this semester. If you notice, the focus of the class hasn't been so much on the algorithms themselves of machine learning, but instead it's been on the other parts of the pipeline, right? It has been on taking data and converting it into the vector space model, loading the data, and all of that. And then Keras is a very wide uh, topic. As I said, Keras is, a, is a, an encapsulation of TensorFlow. And the way that we looked at it was Keras in the very high level API. Now, if you look at uh, the code that I have on GitHub, so you should now be seeing my GitHub code. <laughs> And if you look here under TensorFlow 2, general examples, we basically covered um, you know, the basics of TensorFlow basics and Keras. And then we did not cover subclassing and functional API. Those are, in the end, I kind of decided these are more advanced topics. So I will cover them in ITS 530. So that's the, the next class for this, the deep learning class. Um, so if you know if you're interested in those topics or in, interested in, in, in advanced deep, you know, in actual deep learning algorithms, uh, you know I would strongly suggest you take you enroll in uh, 5:30. Now just a kind of a, a summary. So what we covered here was basically example.py and tf2examples.py. So we covered these in full. I did not cover this one uh, activation functions. Uh, activation functions, we did use them and I did show you some examples of where you would use them. Basically you used sigmoid and you used um, relu and you also used a softmax. So those three, so really, it's really about using those three. I showed you examples of all of those. But, it, but if you actually wanna get into understanding the activation functions, that's something as you might imagine, I will pick up on in 5.30 as that becomes a more advanced uh, set of topics as you start to delve deeper into you know, the deep learning algorithms. As far as Keras, we went over both of these. So I went over the, I think I started with XOR last week, if I remember correctly. And then after XOR, we did the Iris data set. But as you remember from last week, these were pretty much very similar. And then after that, so I so I did cover all of Can you guys mute your microphones, please? Um, so as I was saying, can you guys hear me? All right, so uh, so I so as I was uh, saying, um, 
So we covered basics, right? And then activation functions will be covered in 5.30. We covered Keras in full, but in the end I decided also with the functional API, that's an advanced topic, you know, subclassing and functional APIs. It really, just, it really is, as you can see here, linear, out, linear regression. So that's actually the first algorithm that we study in, in the deep learning class. And so um, it'll just be covered in 5.30. I think, you know, you have a lot of tools already um, to do a lot of things in machine learning. At the end of the day, there's only two things that are really important in this course to get really well, and that's being able to create from any abstract problem, you know, a vector space, right? To create a vector space that you can then feed into machine learning. And as you know, you have a lot of tools, Weka. SK Learn, and now you have Keras, and that's what the last homework assignment is about. So if you remember, we concluded last week <clears throat> just on the last homework assignment, which has to do with uh, just like you've done before, right? Uh, so let's let's take a look at it actually. So anyway, so these are the these are the scripts. If you have an interest in just you know learning a little bit more, more on your own, definitely the where you would continue is to look at activation functions and then of course start going into the functional api and subclassing which is really the very the advanced topics that will take you to the next level of tensorflow 2 and all the deep learning algorithms so really if you master these then you'll have you know all the tensorflow little tricks that you need to get into um you know, the more advanced algorithms like transformers, for instance, which is the latest as of 2017. All right, so um, that's basically the, what's on there. Let's go back now to the, and you should now be seeing the bright space. So you can see the link is here for TensorFlow 2 and Keras. I've already graded the Twitter uh, practical exam. We'll talk a little bit about that today but you can check your grades as well for that. Um, and then the Keras homework, as you can see, is um, here. So let's take a look at it. So this, this will be due, I think I said in two weeks, I want, I, you know, two weeks from last Monday, I wanted to see, um, some results. So next Tuesday, next Monday, I'm going to ask everyone to demo their results where they are so far. Again, you know, very important that you get this right. So here you have the three data sets that we used before, MNIST and RGB images. And what I want you to do is write a report showing the following. For each data set, try different architectures such as logistic regression, neural nets, and deep neural nets. So I showed you how to do that in Keras already, even though you may not understand the intuition of it yet, because you, you have to take 530 for that, you, you can already create some, some of the, use some of these algorithms. And then also, also report metrics such as accuracy, precision, recall, F measure. I showed you how to do that. And then I showed you uh, some code examples of how to plot graphs to visualize the results. So that's what the report will be about. Uh, you know, and next Monday, I would ask you to, you know, do a, a demo, even though it's not the final submission, but, you know, I just want to make sure, every, you know, you guys do it right. All right. Are there any questions before um, we begin? So if, if we look at the calendar and what we have left, um, you can see here, I was going to cover, for instance, naive base. That's something that that topic, you know, naive base is, is nice to know that algorithm, but it's, as you have seen in Weka, it always performs the worst. So it's not really necessarily something that you, as you're doing projects that you would uh, think that it would give you a great advantage, but it's also, it's good to know. <laughs> so, <laughs> Some of these topics will be moved to other classes, like uh, I'll move this to 365 actually. NumPy arrays, we covered some of that, and tensor operations, we covered some of that. 
And then I still need to cover these four modules. They really should just be one module. I mean, I don't think there's anything in here. Yeah. So really what I, what I should have said is uh, reinforcement learning and TensorFlow low-level API. So that's, and that's what we're going to cover today. I'm going to motivate this topic. And then the final topic that we will cover this semester next week will be on supervised learning and if time permits, singular value decomposition and recommender systems. So both of those topics, I believe I can cover in, in two sessions ne uh, next week. So it should be doable. Um, so we'll cover that. But today, uh, the focus of, of today's topic is actually going to be reinforcement learning. And it just means, you know, we're going to do it in the low level API, which Mitch has already created on Scholar. Um, the Conda environment for the low level API, we may need to install some libraries. The code is already written. So I should, I should probably point that out to you. All right. So if we go back to the, am I on GitHub? Yeah. So if we go on GitHub, you should be seeing my GitHub now. And in that folder that, uh, that, you know, when you go on here, deep learning, you can see I have a module called reinforcement learning already. And here it is. This is all the code examples that I have for, um, for reinforcement learning. In particular, I have actually three examples. I have three examples of reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning currently, and I'll explain this in the theory and everything, but currently reinforcement learning, or at least not currently, let me put it another way. In the beginning, reinforcement learning was mainly uh, applied to games, all right? So it's a, it was applied to games. And then now it has extended to things that could be like games, like self-driving cars, um, you know, self-driving drones, you know, robots and, you know, because basically anything that's an agent that has a state, but the, and based on that state and its observations can take actions, okay? And so that's really the thing. So here, the examples that I have are actually three. I have an example of a game called Frozen Lake, which I'll go over today in the lecture, Frozen Lake. And then there's another more advanced example called the taxi cab example. The taxi cab example is about, it's a, it's a these are, both of these are not 3D. Right, they're not 3D. Let me actually add this link before I forget. Let me add this link to the to reinforcement learning. I'm gonna create a link to the code. All right. So I'm just adding that so you can reach it actually from your own um, from your own Git uh, Brightspace. All right, so I've added the link there. So you can see. So as I was saying, um, basically these three I have three implementations of reinforcement learning here for games. One of them is for or two of them are actually for two-dimensional games. So th these are the types of grid games. So for instance, if you've ever played tic-tac-toe, right? Or if you've ever played chess, or if you've ever played um, any other game that's like, you know, 2D grid, that's, it's, this is kind of the same. So Frozen Lake is it's very much a, two, a 2D grid game that's very easy to understand. Taxi Cab is a little bit more complex because it's got a lot more going on. Uh, taxi cab is really about a cab that tries to pick up a person somewhere and then take them to another location. And then uh, what I have in here, the third one is, um, it's called, uh, it's an autopilot for, uh, for a, a simulated airplane. 
So, you know, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a game out. There's a lot of flight simulators. I don't know how many of you have ever, I'm, I'm sure some of you have played a flight simulator. Uh, they've been around, you know, for a long time. Uh, and so if you've ever played in a flight simulator, you know, it, you know they're, they're really about flying an airplane, you know, that kind of thing, simulated, a simulated version of it. But according to, you know, real pilots, the, the simulators are, are very realistic, at least in some of the principles. So at least as far as reinforcement learning, they're useful. Um, there's, two, uh, there's two flight simulators out there. One of them is called um, Flight Simulator 2020, Microsoft, right? The one that just came out. And then there's another one that has been around for a long time also, it's called X-Plane 11. And um, so NASA developed an interface for X-Plane 11. It's a UDP type of software. And it allows you from your own computer, from your, you know, your Linux, Mac, Windows, uh, you can install the, the software. And then you need to have also X-Plane 11, a license for it, it's like $60 or so. And then with that, <clears throat> you can actually then interface your Python code where you can write any machine learning algorithm from TensorFlow, for instance, and you can, in, um, you can then interface that with X-Plane 11 and basically <clears throat> fly the plane, right? So you fly the plane through UDP packets, you know, um, that are being sent from your TensorFlow program to X-Plane 11. So that was developed by NASA. And so <clears throat> you can actually then use that to just add a library. And so what this is, what I have here, I call it deep QAP. So it's Q is because it uses the, a, a reinforcement learning algorithm Q, called Q learning. We'll talk a little bit about that today. AP obviously stands for autopilot. And then deep obviously because you can use deep learning. with this. And so that's kind of the idea. So it's a little API. And you can use this. Uh, so basically, Deep QAP is an implementation of Q learning for automated flight using X-Plane 11 and XPC. XPC is NASA's um, library. So uh, the way that I've developed this is that it's very modular. And so, you know, as you might imagine, an airplane, imagine that you have an agent. And an agent is just a computer system. Con but the con computer system has access to the controls of an airplane. So on an airplane, you have uh, three controls basically for three axes, right? An air, you know, unlike cars where, where they really just have two axes in an airplane, you have three axes, right? There's the altitude as well. Now I should say, even though this is implemented for X plane 11, this same idea could easily, easily be applied to um, self-driving cars, robots, things like that. Um, I, I currently actually have a, I'm also with some students, I'm also developing um, a Raspberry Pi based little car, self-driving car. And so as you might imagine, the, the, the Raspberry Pi can become a Wi-Fi hotspot. And so basically from your laptop, you can connect to it and control it. So it's exactly the same thing as this, where the simulator <clears throat> module can be removed and replace with wire, wire uh, uh, with a library in your own uh, that of your own making wire uh, PI, and that allows you to control the pins on the Raspberry. That allows you to control the all the actuators and servos and everything on the on the self-driving car, an actual physical thing. So what I want you to understand is that this can literally be be plugged in. I mean, the modules can be easily are replaced with, um, <clears throat> with um, <clears throat> other modules, not just for flight, you know, not just for X-Plane 11. In theory, if Windows develops something that you can be used for Windows 2020, it can also be used in any other game that's, you know, self-driving cars. In particular, drones nowadays might be of interest. <clears throat> and I, you know, I currently have some students working on this. So, you know, if any of you have any interest in this, let me know. Uh, there's, there's quite a bit that can be done. So anyway, so the, the, the code is made very modular. 
Uh, it's, it's a basic pipeline here that I provided for just airplane stabilization. So as you might imagine, the first thing you want to do with a, with a plane, I would imagine, is you want it to not be all over the place, right? You want it to stay stable. And so <clears throat> what, I, what I want to say is I, I want to give you some context to control the plane. Let's imagine the plane is in the air already, which is the simplest thing, right? We're not, get, we're not talking about taking off and all that. That's harder. But just the plane appears at 4,000 feet above the ground. So, you know, a safe altitude. So then let the plane do it, you know, now let go of the controls. That's basically what you're doing. You're letting go of the controls, but you, of course you turn on, turn on the reinforcement learning algorithm. So the algorithm has to learn <clears throat> how to fly the plane, right? So if you notice, you know, I haven't talked about the theory of reinforcement learning, but that's because I want to motivate this problem first so that then it makes more sense to you where all the pieces fit in. So anyway, so the plane, you let it go at 4,000 feet. The reinforcement learning algorithm has to do things in order not to crash. So first of all, it's gonna have states. It's got two main ideas, two main ideas. It has something called states, which basically means that the plane does not, you know, the plane at, at every millisecond, it takes readings from things. And usually on airplanes, <clears throat> you have a lot of sensors, right? You have these things called analog sensors. They look like little clocks and they tell you things like the altitude, the attitude of the plane, you know, is one wing too much to the left, too much to the right? Is the nose too, too much uh, going up or down? You know, all these kinds of things, right? So <clears throat> it's measuring these three axes, right? The lateral, vertical, and uh, longitudinal, I think, axes, right? Imagine in a three-dimensional space. So from those observations, which every reinforcement learning algorithm has to have, self-driving cars have LIDAR and they have cameras and they have everything to kind of measure, you know, if you've ever been in one of these cars nowadays that have um, lane assist, right? You're in your car and then you're driving and then you, you veer a little bit to the left and the car somehow with the camera detects that it's getting too close to the line. The, the steering wheel does things, right? So um, the same idea. So all these sensors are providing information to the vehicle. And then what you do is the agent then needs to take these, um, all of these <clears throat> sensors and convert them into just one state. So imagine the more sensors you have, the more states you're gonna have it. It's very exponential like that. And for the longest time, you couldn't really solve these things. But now, again, because of GPUs and deep learning, you can because they have the computing power that we didn't really have before. So that's the first thing, um, the state, right? The observation is that's probably obvious to you. And then the second thing, and there's more things, but the second important thing is actions. <clears throat> what actions can you take? Well, on an airplane, you have uh, pedals, and you have the, the yoke, what is called a yoke, or you can call it the steering wheel. But remember that unlike in a car where you only turn left and right, in, a, in an airplane, you also can push it forward or, or pull it back, right? And so because, you know, you need to dive or you need to climb left or right, and then the pedals control the tendency of sort of the, the rudder in the back, like on the boat, right? And so, um, and so you have these three controls. And there's also the throttle, actually, the throttle. Obviously, because if you give it, if you take the power off, the plane loses power and gravity takes over, right? So it starts to descend like a glider, for instance. You give it more power, it starts to climb again because, you know, it starts to like push air down, you know, get that whole uh, lift, you know, that whole principle, Bernoulli or whatever. So, so all of that, those are the actions that you take. And that's similar to in a car, right? In a car, your eyes tell you, uh oh, you know, I have a car in front of me, I have a car to the left, to the right. So those are your sensors. And, and that's your observations, which become state. Where you are at every, milli, every millisecond or so. The actions are in the car, turn left, right, hit the brakes, right? Unfortunately, on a plane, there's no brakes, right? You can't hit the brakes actually. So you have to do other things uh, to keep the plane under control. Anyway, so obviously 
uh, with just stay, staying within this game, um, there's a lot of things that you can do, like take off land, turn left, turn right, go to fro go from A to B, you know, flip the plane over and then try to recover, you know, all kinds of things like that. This program can potentially do all of that, but the module that I've implemented is only for aircraft stabilization. So that is to say, you let go of the control. If you let go of the controls of a plane, you know, the plane has a tendency, it, they're not in super stable. And so <clears throat> the torque <clears throat> will start turning it to the left and one wing can start acting very strangely and eventually the plane could lose control if you let go of the controls. However, that's where the reinforcement learning algorithm comes in. It tries to prevent that and it tries to learn how to stabilize, okay? And so that's really the idea. So the code is Python and that's what this module does. Um, to get started is very easy. You get Xplain 11, you get the NASA uh, Xplain Connect, and then you actually use the code that I provided here. This works with uh, Mac OS. Well, I tested it with a Mac, but, it, but I've also tested it with my Linux machine and it works really well. Um, so the code, Really, um, and, and as I said, you just to kind of motivate, there's, because it's very modular, there's XPC here, which is the NASA code. Then there's the simulator itself, which is where you define the, as you would call it, like the physics of the environment. But in this case, it's not really the physics of the simulator. It's really more um, how to interact with or communicate with the, the simu with the simulator, which you're really doing through XPC. Then you specify uh, the how to, you know, the, the main code where you have the main for loop of, of learning every second. <clears throat> and then after that, you have the reinforcement learning part. And the reinforcement learning part is really divided into two things, something called Q learning, which is what I'll talk about today. And then what, you know, what's in an, and then there's some additional functions related to the environment. And, and that's usually what are called the reward functions. So basically it means, you know, like imagine like if you do, if you're little and, and they, you know, or let's say you have a dog and you're training your dog, you know, you give them a treat, right? You give them a treat every time they do something good. And then you don't give them a treat every time they do something bad. So it's the same thing here. This code here defines the reward functions and penalties basically that allow you to, to determine if the airplane did something good or bad. And that's kind of how it works, okay? So there's a lot of code. Obviously, we're not gonna start here. This code is just to motivate what you can do with reinforcement learning. Uh, we're gonna start at a simpler uh, piece of code, which is called, um, for, the, for another game, um, Frozen Lake. But I wanted really to start with this, just to kind of show you that it's not just in that little realm of games, but it actually works in real, in real things. So I, I do have a, a simulation here, or not, sorry, not a simulation. I have a, not a simulation, uh, a video, I guess is what I, what I mean. Okay, so I don't know if you guys can see this video, but can you guys see it? Yeah, we can see the video play. So the, in this video, um, that's the plane. That's X-Plane 11. So as you can see, it provides a lot of things. And that's really the great thing about this kind of work. If you find this simulator, if you find the simulator that has all the physics already and everything, and, and then all you have to do is, if, if you were playing the game, what do you have? You have a joystick, right? So all of us, you know, have some kind of, I probably have a lot of, joysticks for a lot of games that we've had over the past. And, and through the joystick, we control the plane. And that's similar to like in real life, we've had a steering wheel. So well, well, in a sense, what XPC has done, what NASA created is that they have created a virtual joystick, right? A virtual joystick. And then through the virtual joystick, then you, inter you interface it, excuse me, with your own Python code and then you can, you can basically learn how to fly. So as you can see in this video, uh, this is after a lot of iterations. So currently the, the code is running there. You can see it's already on game 14, move, uh, move or game 15, whatever. 
and I'm keeping track of everything. And <clears throat> what, the, what the plane is doing at this point is it, it has actually learned a little bit, right? So the wings still, the wings still uh, are oscillating a little bit, but there's, there, it is st more stable now than before. So I, I didn't record the whole video from like beginning to end. So sometimes it does still uh, dive, but you can see the nose no longer climbs up and down. It has learned how to do that. You can see that some, oops, and that's it, I guess. So, uh, but that's basically the, the example there of the video. And so what the plane was doing is it was learning how to stabilize it. Okay. Um, so anyway, I, I show that video again to motivate really what you can do with this. So a lot of the time when you hear about self-driving cars and all that, you can, you can now begin to understand, oh, it's some of these types of algorithms. Keep in mind that uh, Airbus, for instance, already has machine learning algorithms that don't not only use the sensors of the plane, right? But they also use like cameras. It's basically like they're mimicking now the eyes of a pilot and they can see everything. And of course with self-driving cars and everything. I know that for a long time, self-driving cars have been using LIDAR, which is like a type of radar. But I think they say that the image, the image processing is now also really good. So that LIDAR may not be necessary in the future. So anyway. A lot of changes, obviously, in this field. All right, so anyway, that's pretty much as far as motivation is concerned. So now what I'm gonna do is, as I said, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm gonna go back to the code. I'm gonna start with a simpler example now, which is Frozen Lake. Frozen Lake, it's a little type of a game that we can all just easily uh, pick up really quickly. Uh, and I'll, that's what I'm going to use to describe how everything works in Q-learning. But you already know that with, it takes very little. So if you look, if you look over here, if I go to deep QAP, pretty much all this code is about controlling the plane in the simulator. Really only this, these few functions here have to do with the reinforcement learning part and these functions over here in the environment, there's a few more in here, but these have to deal with state and uh, reward functions. So it's really not that much. Uh, so it, it doesn't take that much because a lot of it is the simulator itself has to be running in the background. It controls it for you. So the way this works is that you usually need to have a simulator and then the reinforcement learning. They're two separate things. <clears throat> in this case, I use X-Plane 11. <laughs> Others in the, in the past, they use, um, so let's say now, let's, let's look at uh, Frozen Lake. So Frozen Lake is also about playing a game. To play this game, it's the same thing. The reinforcement learning is separate from the, look at how short the code is, it's pretty short. The reinforcement learning part is separate from the game. To play the game Frozen Lake, you need a library called uh, Jim. So, so Open AI Jim is a standard library in Python. I don't know if you can see it. You should be able to see this. Okay. Yeah. So Open AI Jim is a library in Python for playing games. There's a lot of it's mainly board games, so it's not really. But there are other libraries. There's a, is there's a library to play Atari games. So they're a little bit more complex than these. Um, there's um, a lot of simulators out there. I've, I've shown you there's X-Plane 11. There's also um, uh, from the creators of Fortnite, uh, what are they called? Um, Unreal Engine. Unreal Engine develops for some of their clients like Ford Motor Company, et cetera, they develop, because you know Fortnite creates these virtual worlds, like, you know, for Fortnite, where multiplayer games, I think they're called. So <clears throat> you can use Unreal Engine, which they may make available for free, and you could create your own virtual worlds, and then use those virtual worlds with reinforcement learning to train things. So I, what I think Ford does is that they've created virtual worlds of cities, for instance, you know, Chicago, New York, what have you. 
and try to simulate like pedestrians, try to simulate, you know, all that traffic in the streets. And then they have a car in there and then they have the reinforcement learning and that's how they're training their models. And then, you know, before, obviously you don't want to deploy or you don't want to have a reinforcement learning model learning, um, you know, in, um, in with real people, right? That probably is not a good idea. So anyway, so you need, so always you need some kind of a game or simulator. And so as you get started with the, these concepts, the very first, but as I said, I do want to stress very easily, you can take out the module of simulator and put in a real module. So for instance, as I said, you know, like with a Raspberry Pi little car, you know, that, that's something I've tried and that's probably the best thing. Obviously you could probably do it with Raspberry Pi driven drones. But the problem with that is you're going to crash your drone uh, and it's going to cost you a lot of money or RC planes also. Um, <clears throat> probably, I think, if you're trying to do something with hardware, a uh, Raspberry, uh, Raspberry car with a lot of like bumpers around it would probably be a good, a good way to start. But otherwise, simulators is the way to go and, you know, to develop the model first before you deploy it into something physical. So, <clears throat> Usually where you start when you're learning reinforcement learning then is you can just start with Python's uh, gym. And like I said, but there's a lot of very great libraries already that provide color 3D simulations. They're not as good as let's say X-Plane 11, but they're still pretty, you know, much better than this. Uh, because these, this one that we're gonna use is very much a console type uh, simulation. So it's not gonna have like actual it's not going to have actual, um, you know, graphics or anything like that. It's, it's just on the screen itself. All right. So anyway, that's sort of the idea. Okay. So this is the code that I'm going to describe today. As you can see, it's pretty short, pretty short indeed. Um, and that's going to be for um, explain, oh, sorry, for uh, Frozen Lake. Are there any questions so far, guys? Any questions? No questions? All right, so then let me open up the, the notes. <clears throat> so this is 520. So I'm going to share with you um, a Word document here on the share. So I'm going to share this. <clears throat> All right, so you should now be seeing a Word document that I have on here. Let me just load it. Okay, can you guys see it? Can you see, uh, it says chapter nine, reinforcement learning. All right, so I, I'm sharing this. I actually think I have this on my website, so let me just double check on that. Um, if I go, All right, let me. All 
So you sh are you guys, what are you guys? Okay, so you should be seeing a PDF, I think, right? And if you go to this PDF, there it is. So this chapter, I'm going to make it available on the on the bright space should be the whole chapter yeah. right so there it is chapter 9 it says so i'm going to copy this and i'm going to move it to the bright space And that way you can actually read this on your own time. So let me add another link on here. Okay. Chapter nine, it says, which is reinforcement learning. Okay, so there you have, so basically the chapter that I'm gonna cover right now, um, you can read it. All right, so now let's go to okay. All right, so there we are. All right, so now uh, you should be seeing <clears throat> the PDF chapter nine reinforcement learning. Okay, so I'm just, you know, I'm going to use this as part of the book, right? As part of my book, and I'm going to use this chapter to kind of motivate. Uh, the topic. So I'm going to use it as slides. Um, so basically, you know, I'm going to be covering it as I motivated already reinforcement learning. Uh, so now I'm going to get into the, the specifics of it. So reinforcement learning is machine learning. Okay. Some people will say sometimes my areas of interest, I say this actually, I'll say my areas of interest are deep learning and reinforcement learning. And the way that, the reason why I would say that is that reinforcement learning has been around way before deep learning came around. Okay, so, so deep learning then came around as, as a set of algorithms. And then some very clever people figured out that they could actually lose, use the techniques of, of deep learning in reinforcement learning. So basically they took that thing that was really nice and interesting and made it really powerful, okay? Uh, and so that, that's really what I discuss in this chapter, but that's really, again, you know, currently in 520, I'm only going to cover reinforcement learning without deep learning. If you take 530 then, um, I would uh, cover deep reinforcement learning and how, how to make that transition. So um, this is an area of machine learning somewhere between supervised learning, which is what we've been covering all semester, and unsupervised learning, which is um, we're, we're the last topic that we're going to cover this semester. So we're going to wrap up with unsupervised learning. So it, uh, basically, Reinforcement learning is somewhere between that. So, so supervised learning is machine learning where you have labels, right? And then on supervised learning is machine learning where you don't have labels. So you only have the data, no labels. So then basically you got to figure out structure in your data using unsupervised learning. Whereas with supervised learning, as you know already, you have labels. Okay, very, very important.
So uh, it has been extensively applied to things like recommender systems and AI-based games, which I've already motivated a lot today. Recently, it was shown that a deep Q network, right, and Q network being a, or, or Q learning being a, a, a technique from reinforcement learning that has been enhanced with deep learning. So it has been shown that using only pixels and game scores as inputs, the game could surpass or, or the deep Q network could surpass or and, and achieve a <clears throat> playing level comparable to that of professional human gamers. And this was done across a set of 49 Atari games in, 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 uh, in as recently as 2015. Right, so five years ago, uh, that's where the state of the art was. Obviously now, you know, it has gone further up, but basically they had a, a machine learning algorithm based on reinforcement learning that was able to, to basically play better than uh, professional Atari players. Now you probably didn't know that there's a profession uh, for Atari gamers. Uh, Okay. So anyway, that's what people people do with this with Q learning, right? So currently, you know, even though uh, I didn't have time to cover that in this sem in this semester, there's a actually nowadays an equation that some people at DeepMind have come up with that basically says, you know, what defines a good artificial intelligence. And I think one of the key things of that equation is that it should generalize well to a lot of problems. And so, because a lot of things are very specific, right? And that's what they're doing with these games nowadays is that initially they played something like Frozen Lake or, you know, then now, if you notice what's important here, actually, although it may not seem, is that it played 49 Atari games. So you can see that 49. And why is that important? It's important because what that implies is that M knees or knees, uh, however you pronounce that name, I think the M is silent or me and the N is silent. Um, it, they, his group didn't just develop an algorithm to play one single game. So that's like me saying, oh yeah, I developed this module to fly X plane 11. Well, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be better if I developed a model and by the way, it can play X plane 11, it can play car based games, it can play motorcycle based games, boat games, train games, and even people walking on the street. The difference there is that the model generalizes as well to other problems. So it's not just specific to that one. And that's very critical. Okay, that's very critical. And so that's where the research is nowadays. It's building, you know, building much more intelligent systems. And reinforcement learning has made a lot of, or deep reinforcement learning has made some astonishing, actually, astonishing. Uh, developments. A lot of people, uh, Elon Musk and, and, and his group, and a lot of people really do believe that self-driving cars are maybe five, ten years away. Um, yeah, I think it's possible, actually. So uh, it's amazing what this technology is, is starting to do. And you should, you, should, you should definitely keep an eye on, on it. That's why I'm introducing it to you in this class. Unfortunately, this, un, um, honestly speaking, we could literally have a whole course on just reinforcement learning. Right, it's such a wide topic that it's independent of itself. Um, and, but unfortunately, you know, we don't have that course here in the, in the university. So we, we can't really just make a whole semester of it. But at least uh, this, the lecture today will give you enough, um, enough that if you find this interesting, I've made the chapter, you know, this is a chapter from my book, but I've made it freely available to you. Um, so may, and the code also is available freely to you. So if you have an interest in this, certainly, you know, hopefully with what you already know about machine learning, plus, you know, this, you can be on your way. All right, so, um, so, so what's the trick here, right? What's the trick with reinforcement learning? So the main advantage of playing reinforcement, and, and this also, by the way, this chapter, you'll see a few typos here and there. It's an old version. It's not my current version of the chapter, so it's a little bit, uh, has a few issues. All right, so the main, but, but the substance is okay. 
So the main advantage of applying reinforcement learning to games is that games are governed by rules. You guys know this, right? So I'm sure, I don't know how many, you know, I play chess with my dad, you know, I love playing chess and, it, and, and I'm sure you play other games and you know that games are structured by rules, right? You know, I don't know if you've ever played chess, but you know, there's a lot of rules that you have to kind of understand how to, how to move the pieces. Uh, you know, what piece goes where, what, what a piece can do. And, and the whole strategy is based on that. And at the end of the day, based on those rules, you win or lose. Maybe you heard uh, Deep Blue many years ago uh, defeated uh, Gary Kasparov uh, playing, uh, playing chess, right? And this is way back then when they, you know, because I should say, I guess, I'll talk a little bit historically about chess. It's very important to AI. But you know, Deep Blue, I think it was in the 90s, I can't remember, beat Gary Kasparov, who was a master at chess. Um, and so Deep Blue beat him. But back then, Deep Blue was, was created by IBM as a computer that had a search tree, I believe, and it had a whole bunch of rules, a lot of heuristic rules. So what are heuristic rules? Heuristic rules are rules developed by humans like if statements, if this and if that, and then do the search tree here and so on, boom. So even though that computer was really impressive back then, it wasn't machine learning, okay? It was more human expert encoding of their knowledge into the machine, okay? So I, I wanna stress that because that's very different. It's called, and that's called heuristic rule. Whereas what I'm talking about here, reinforcement learning is machine learning, which basically means, yes, you give it a set of rules and principles, but you don't give it any knowledge about the particulars of the game. You don't tell it, okay, this is how you win. You only say things like, well, this is your goal to achieve and you're gonna get a reward if you, if you improve that goal or a penalty and of course, you define the laws of the game, just like we have the laws of physics, right? The laws of physics in our world say, I can't jump and reach the, the, the clouds, right? That doesn't happen because gravity is going to keep me grounded, you know? Um, and so that's a law of physics. I mean, you can't break those, right? You know, I can't, I don't have superhuman strength or anything, you know, it's, it's just the laws of physics. Well, in a game, you have the laws of the game, right? You can't, you know, you can only do certain bishop goes in, in diagonals in chess and, and things like that. You can only do certain types of moves, okay? And so <clears throat> that's what's really important about this, that I want you to understand the difference between Deep Blue back then, I think it was called Deep Blue, and, and today, right? So that was a whole bunch of rules and heuristics. Machine learning and reinforcement learning is, is the machine is literally learning. So the machine starts with a table and the table only has random data, especially in Q learning. That random data needs to be replaced with actual weights that have meaning based on a state and, and an action. And that's what we're going to see today. Please, you know, I, I, you know I, I, with these virtual classes, it's very difficult for me when I talk to you guys because I don't know if, um, you know, if, if things are um, registering. So let, please ask questions if you have them. Or, you know, I don't know, but stop me at any point if, if something is not clear, okay? So actually, uh, the interest in AI, so AI, so I, I wanted to say historically, AI has always had a very strong interest in games, in particular in chess and in developing machines. This goes back all the way to Claude Shannon. So if you remember, we talked about Claude Shannon in 350. He was great for encryption, but he actually is the father of, of information theory. And, and later, you know, although back then when he was in the 50s and 60s, there were no like really electronic computers, right? Everything was more like, uh, uh, you know, like a machinery type of, I forget the word, but mechanical, mechanical, there you go, mechanical computers. It wasn't until the transistor that came in and made, you know, created the computers that we know today. But Claude Shannon, even back then had a serious, he was a very eccentric character. And he had a very serious interest in, uh, games and in, in, in intelligence. He is believed to have created one of the first actual reinforcement learning games uh, type of thing uh, where he, he taught a mouse, he created a labyrinth 
and he had a mouse and the mouse had to get to the cheese and without, you know, in the, in the fastest possible way. And so initially the mouse randomly would hit a lot of walls and it would take forever. But eventually he figured out how to get the mouse to learn the appropriate path. And at the very end of a lot of iterations, the mouse would get to the cheese really quickly. And so that, that first game, which is, you know, historically in, in like museums and things, you can look up how he did that. Um, but basically since then, there's been a lot of study, obviously. Um, AI, the field of AI has done a lot of this. So if you, if you, you know, uh, we're going to teach a class 265, Introduction to AI, and I'm sure Professor Kim is going to be teaching it, I think, next semester. And I'm sure um, there's going to be a lot of uh, discussion of chess there as an introduction. to AI. But anyway, what I want to say, what I want to stress is I want you to understand that a lot were heuristic based, based on coded rules. Reinforcement learning is not that. And then deep reinforcement learning, as I said, if you take 530, I'll cover that then, takes what we're going to learn about this idea and extend it um, to a more powerful basis. Okay. Are there any questions so far in any of this, guys? Is this making sense? Are you guys understanding? Did you guys fall asleep? Are you good? Okay. okay. All right. So, uh, so let's continue then. And as I said, read through this chapter. That's probably the best thing. What I I'm not going to give a homework on this, but I'm get, I've given you the code. And what I'll say is run Frozen Lake and maybe even Taxi Cab, the code that I provided. You can, you can run it on uh, Scholar. Just use the, uh, you'll have to use the um, TensorFlow 1 uh, environment that Mitch created, not TensorFlow 2. The Conda environment, because it, 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 the code is written for TensorFlow 1. But before I forget, I want to say as not homework, but just as for your own knowledge, run those two. You don't have to, you won't be able to run uh, the, the, pilot, the flight simulator, unfortunately, because unless you buy, you have to buy a license for X-Plane 11, which is $70. I mean, it's not really that expensive, especially if you like gamings, games. Um, all right, anyway, so definitely before I forget, run those you know, on your own time. So the main advantage of applying reinforcement learning to games is that games are governed by rules. So I've said, you know, I've talked a lot about that. Uh, <clears throat> and so what this means is that in supervised learning, which is what we've studied all semester, we always had labels, right? So in Iris, we had, you know, we had uh, vectors of four features, and then we had labels, Satosa, Virginica, Versicola. In M an MNIST data set, we had 10 classes the digits 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, right? So we had all of that. So, um, you know, that's, you know, that's really important uh, in supervised learning. And on supervised learning, we would have the IRIS data set features F1, 2, F3, F4, no labels whatsoever. Here we have something sort of in between. We don't initially have labels. However, we have the following. Whenever we take a vector, F1, F2, F3, F4, we run it through the game because that is the actions that we take, let's say, given the state. And what's going to happen in the game is that, for instance, just to take an exaggerated example, if you're driving a car, you're going to crash the car into the wall or you're not going to crash the car into the wall. So if you had an, a, an option of turning left or right, well, if you turn left, you crash into the wall. If you turn right, you don't crash into the wall. What did you learn about turning? Just from that one example, you learn uh, don't turn left, you know, that, that kind of thing, okay? And so <clears throat> that's what happens with reinforcement learning is that you get that, that's why it's called reinforcement learning because you learn by reinforcement. You get feedback from <clears throat> the system, in this case, either a simulator or a game, okay? 
or you know sensors this you know you could also have a physical machine that senses that it the bumper hit something and that's a bad thing especially if you hit a pedestrian right so that's really a bad thing all right <clears throat> so so you have so the key thing is that you have game states which are going to be the inputs and you have actions the output so it's really the mapping here is you know whereas before in, in supervised learning again in, in iris data set for instance you had f1 f2 f3 f4 those were the inputs the in, input vector right and then the action was septosa virginica versicola well here that that can change a little bit so for example now we could say that the game states are the inputs you know where you are and the outputs are the actions you're going to take and the actions that you're going to take are a vector all right a vector so for instance for that for the plane in x plane i have a vector of six right where is turn left turn right push the nose down pull it up and step on the right pedal step on the left pedal if you notice i don't even there's also the idea of the of the throttle the power you know give it more power or less power but for stabilization i just left the power at the same and that you know kind of a medium range and that's because the fewer actions i have you know the less i have to worry about right so you know i wanted to reduce the number of parameters so that's the same with a car i would imagine with a car you have to use brakes i mean you can't you know that you know you can't just like at 150 miles an hour or whatever say it's a race car you can't just take every turn without braking a little i would imagine so in the car the actions would be brake uh accelerator and let's imagine it's an automatic so it's not you know no like uh, manual transmission so then it would be uh brake accelerator turn left turn right at least right that that kind of makes sense so you'd have four actions you either turn left you turn right now how much because you might say how much to the left how much to the right usually it's a step size and what the what the what the reinforcer learning algorithm should learn is well you know if a little bit to the left didn't work apply more to the left and more to the left and more to the left so so it's really just left right uh on break off break off accelerator on accelerator but without a, without defining the amount of pressure that you're going to because that would just multiply the number of parameters <clears throat> obviously you you know if you were actually doing research in, in, in driving a car like that you'd probably want to read the literature find other papers that have done it so that you have a better understanding of what's going on in any case uh, the inference function then, as you might remember, y equal mx plus b, here becomes kind of the y is the actions, the output vector, and the x is the inputs, the game states, where you are in the game. So anyway, so you have the game states and the actions that lead to new states, and in particular, they lead to what are called rewards. And rewards are the objectives to maximize. So th this is the thing that you you need to you want to maximize getting to the cheese right so if you hit a wall you should actually get like minus 5 minus 5 but if you take a if you make an action and you don't crash into anything that should be like a plus 2 and if you make another action and you don't hit anything that's another plus 2 if you if you if you reach a milestone that should be a plus 5 and if you get to the cheese that should be a plus 20 all right, so now that's the part of reinforcement learning that is a little bit tough. And because that's called defining the reward functions and defining the reward functions is the, one of the hardest parts because the reward functions unfortunately depend entirely on the game itself. They depend on, you know, or, or the environment, right? So if you're teaching, so, so let me give you the classic example. There's a famous paper out there of how do you teach a robot to dance um, salsa? I mean, what, it, what, a, what, a, what on earth would be the reward function for that? You see that, you know, 
it's very and now imagine that you want to teach you know uh somebody to take apart a combustion engine what is the reward function for that you see that it's very, so it becomes really difficult and so so that's where a lot of the challenge is is defining these reward functions uh, because so that that definitely you know you need to that's why and that's why I said when you take a class like you know when you talk about the topic of reinforcement learning you really have to spend a semester because there's so much that goes into just looking you really have to look at examples of lots of reward functions for different problems you know and all kinds of things like that so as a conclusion because we have this mechanism of rewards and states and actions and we have the rules of the game, uh, no annotation is needed. Instead, you rely on the rules of the game for feedback. So instead of annotated label, labels. So I, so I hope this is clear. Uh, this is something that if you don't understand at this point in the semester, you really need to see me because uh, it's, you know, it, this is something, again, it goes back to the vector space model. So one thing I wanna say before I forget, one thing, you know, a lot of you did really well in the Twitter exam, but I still saw some of you that don't understand that a sample should be an entire tweet. Okay, a sample should be an entire tweet. And then you use the bag of words approach to represent the words that appear in that tweet as ones or the count of those words in the vector and the, the rest of the features are zeros, right? Remember that if you have 30, let's say 100 words that you're using to represent each one of those tweets, then you all vectors are of size 100 but only the words that appear in that tweet would get once or above in there and the other ones have zero. So a lot of you got this right, most of you, but some of you I've noticed still we're not doing that correct. So uh, again, if you're having that problem, um, you know, you're, you, you need to see me. Okay, so um, anyway, going back, I just wanted to say that before I forget. So, there are several types of reinforcement learning. So I'm here, hopefully you're following along because uh, you can read the PDF. Um, so there, there are several types of reinforcement learning techniques. Um, in, my, in, this in the chapter in my book, and in fact, in, in, my, um, in this discussion today, I'm only focusing on Q-learning. Uh, focusing on Q-learning, which is this one, because it, Q learning is the one that has been uh, become very popular. It's the technique that has been used by Min 2015 and his Atari games. You know, nowadays there's AlphaGo, which is um, a game. Go is a game that is supposed to be more complex than chess, I think. And it was uh, Go was. Um, AlphaGo is, is again a Q learning based reinforcement learning algorithm that defeated the, the, Nash, the, the world champion. I think it was a South Korean master and he was defeated. And then uh, after that, I think came Alpha Zero. Uh, and Alpha Zero is again this generalization. So now they created a game that could defeat masters, not just in Go, but in chess. And it's the same algorithm. And remember, again, that's really the key. Uh, as, as far as people have defined AI nowadays, that um, AI algorithms that are true AI are the ones that generalize to multiple things. Um, if I have time at the end of the semester, I'll, I'll show you guys that equation is really very interesting. I just, you know, I haven't had time to put that in here. All right, so uh, anyway, that's pretty much the one. So really this class or this chapter, I should stress, is only about Q learning. It is, that's part of reinforcement learning, but that's not what I'm, I'm not covering the whole of reinforcement learning. I'm, I'm only focusing on the one algorithm that I think that we can grasp uh, quite uh, quickly, okay? So here I'll try to provide a single, in, a simple intuition based on uh, base description of the technique. I should note that to achieve, obviously, the kind of uh, this, uh, my explanation is not at all the Q learning implemented in the MIN paper. Obviously, that has a lot of optimizations and things to make it better, uh, as you do with when you have a specific problem. This is just more of a general discussion uh, so that you understand a little bit about Q learning. All right, so what is Q learning? 
So Q learning tries to learn the value of being in a given state, let's call it S, and taking a specific action from there. All right, so it's really a table. That's all it is. I have a, I'll show you, I have a little table and Q learning, the, the basic intuition is that it's a, a simple little table. And in that table, you learn associations, which are you know, basically like in a neural net, right? Remember in a neural net, we had input neurons and output neurons and the links between them were called the weights. And those weights represented the relationship between neurons in one layer and neurons in the next. Well, same thing here. We have the initial layer is the states, the next layer is the actions, and the links in between them are the weights. And we are going to learn those. Okay, so that's really the idea. Uh, so as I, as I indicated, Q-learning has been applied to games. Uh, the, base, the best way to understand uh, the algorithm is to analyze it from the point of view of a game. So here, you know, I've already stressed, you need to, uh, uh, we can use OpenAI Gym. So if, if, when you try this on Scholar, if OpenAI Gym, I don't know if Mitch installed it, I'm assuming he probably didn't. So in the TensorFlow one, you'll have to install AI Gym. I'm sure it's pretty straightforward. I would imagine it's something like Conda install Gym or something like that. Um, so, so Google it, but it should be pretty easy to install. So we're gonna use OpenAI Gym to play, uh, and then we will select the simplest, one of the simplest games. I think they have tic-tac-toe, but let, let's start with Frozen Lake, the game environment. Um, so, so let's think about Frozen Lake, and this is really Frozen Lake right there. So you should now be seeing a four by four grid, right, that has 16 cells, and that's literally the game, Frozen Lake, okay? Um, so, you know, this is pretty straightforward. I'm sure in, in, a, in some of your classes, you've taken um, some, done some games. So you have some intuition on how this works. So Frozen Lake is a game about crossing a frozen lake. So that, that's all it is. But the, now the lake has some cracks in the ice with holes in them. And there's also wind sometimes and the wind pushes you. So if you, you, can, you know, you're standing in, in the frozen ice and the wind just pushes you and it might move you to a hole. So obviously if you fall in a hole, you fall in the water and then game over. And so, sometimes that pushes the person crossing it. So the game is very simple and consists of a grid that is four by four like so. So this obviously the states, uh, as every time you play the game, the states can be reshuffled. Right, so here you can see, you know, the start is here, and then you have whole, 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 and then there's the cheese. And the cheese, you know, it's just an example, it could be anything. Uh, so the idea then is that if you start here, well, how do you win the game? You're obviously not gonna go forward, because if you go forward, you fall on the ice. So you go left, then you go forward, then you have to decide, okay, I'm gonna go left, then I'm gonna go forward, then I'm gonna go forward and then I go to the right. But the key, here's the key thing. You're humans, you're intelligent. So just by looking at this, you were able to figure that out. But a game does not have those rules initially, right? All it knows is that when it gets to the cheese, it's great. You know, it's gonna get a huge reward. Whenever it steps on something that is frozen, it gets like a one. If it hits a hole, it game over. And if it hits, let's say that you're in frozen, but you, you go in this direction, you know, you, you lose points because that's not, you know, you're hitting, let's say a wall or something. So usually the, the way that you might think about this is that you randomly do it, right? So if I randomly, okay, go this way, go this way, go this way, go back, go back, go to start. Okay, no, go back, go to frozen, then here. Can you guys see my mouse as I'm moving it? I think you can, right? Can you see my yeah, mouse? Okay, great. So if you, you go here, and then I go here, and then I should go there, but you know what? I went this way, and then boom, I, I fell, and the game is over. So then you start again, and now boom, you fell in the hole, game over. Now what's happening though, as you're doing this, even though you're making mistakes, you're recording those things. So you're saying, if I was in, in, in this, in the start state and I went forward and game over, 
that should get a, a negative points. So that's not a way to go. So the next time around, you're here. Should you go forward? Well, last time around, the game was over really quickly. So no, I'm going to try something else. And so what do you so what do you try? Well, if I try right, I lost one point. If I go back, I lost one point. But if I went to the left, I actually got two positive points. So I'm going to go to the left again because I know that that will give me a reward of plus two, for instance. But all of that needs to be encoded in a way, and that's where the reinforcement learning algorithm comes in, okay? That's where the reinforcement learning game comes in. Or, or sorry, algorithm. So again, if you're here, okay, well, you don't know. Randomly, you could go left and get lucky, but you know, you have a lot of holes there. So you're very likely to just go, want to go forward and boom, you made a mistake. So what are you going to learn this time? You're going to learn that if you are in this state, and what is this state? This state is encoded by saying row three, well, no, row, uh, row two, sorry, row, row two, if we go from up to down, so row two, column three. If I am in state, row two, column three, and I go forward, that's a bad thing because the last time around, I fell in the hole. So as you can see, you have to do many, 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 many iterations of, of the game, and you have to basically crash, die, you know, whatever. That's why, for instance, when I did the, um, the, the stabilization on, on the plane, I had to start at 4,000 feet because I found that if I started even at 3,000 feet, the plane would eventually, because in the beginning, it's really out of control. So you should see, I should have actually recorded in the beginning. It looks really like very, very exciting, like a movie, you know, how that plane is all over the place and it's diving and, and climbing and things like that. I, you know, um, if I didn't give it a buffer of 4,000 feet, I, it crashed a lot. And so I had to then restart everything and I wasted many hours. So the best approach is really to um, give it a lot of iterations, it's gonna crash, but that's why we use a, a simulator, okay? A simulator. And so, so hopefully that makes sense. That's the game. The states are going to be then 16 positions. Now imagine the, the real world does not have 16 positions. The real world has millions of positions. So you can see how this can get really complex, um, you know, exponentially really quickly, right? If you apply it to real things. So you have to find ways to simplify it. But as it turns out, you can, you know, you can and, and it actually works. All right, so it's 320. Let's take a 10 minute break um, and I'll continue with, these, uh, with this lecture, finish it up during the second uh, half. And this will give me an, an option right now to start generating this video, okay guys? So I will see you in 10 minutes.